Got it. That's right. That's nice because we don't have all the like human power and human time to get transcriptions. But if we can get something like automatically generated, it's it's a little bit it's more helpful than nothing, right? So, hi, welcome. It's March first. Um, it is humanitarian engineering and science colloquium time. Uh, my name is Beth Reddy. I'm a professor at um, Colorado School of Mines. I, I'm an assistant professor in the in um, engineering design and society. Um, and I am so happy to welcome you here today um, for a colloquium series that we put together with our partners at um, Western Colorado University. Um, this is just such a great opportunity to get um, people interested in um, environmental management and in humanitarian engineering and science together to talk and think. And we are so uh, happy to have our speakers today. So I'm gonna let, let Dave introduce the, the people who are kind enough to join us, but I will let you know that I'm gonna be running some moderation in the background. Mm -hmm. um, I'm gonna invite you if you have any challenges with tech, just uh, direct message me, Elizabeth Reddy. Um, I can, I'm gonna put my name in the chat too, so that you know if you have anything that needs help, I can take care of it. Um, on that note, Dave, do you wanna take it away? Yeah, thanks Beth, that was great. So hi, I'm Dave Ellerbrook. I'm a lecturer in the Master's of Environmental Engineering program at uh, Western Colorado University. And I also work at Brown and Caldwell. And uh, my, my role there is actually director of strategy for the uh, private sector uh, enterprise. Um, but what we've organized tonight is kind of a unique um, format. So we're gonna talk about corporate social responsibility and rather have the usual death by PowerPoint uh, presentation, we're gonna have a conversation. And we've invited a number of people to this conversation. Um, I'll start with Eleanor Allen who is the CEO for Water for People. And she has um, a long relationship working with uh, Brown and Caldwell. And she is gonna talk a little bit about um, values and ethics at Water for People and what it's like to work uh, with, um, with people from the uh, private sector in terms of teaming. And then she's gonna um, give some examples of some um, of the challenges she's faced around ethics and responsibility in the nonprofit sector. Um, we also have Rich Diamato. He's the CEO for Brown and Caldwell, and he's gonna kind of take a similar format. So we're, um, we're actually gonna have Rich go first, talk about how values drive business decisions in the private sector. And then we'll go to Eleanor for her, her take on that. And then both Rich and Eleanor are gonna spend a couple minutes talking about some of the tough decisions. So we're gonna kind of give you some examples of how this has worked. Um, and then uh, based upon a, a great suggestion from Jessica Smith, I have a couple young professionals here from Brown and Caldwell. So that's Savannah Miller and Angela Brush. We'll ask them just to kind of give a quick impression of what they heard at Eleanor and Rich say, but they're really here uh, to answer your questions from um, a young professional uh, perspective, you know, what it's like to work at a company that professes to have these values, do they really see it in action? Um, so I think that will be a great interaction. So post your questions up into the chat as we go. Um, and Beth will help uh, feed those to me when we get to the discussion period. Uh, but with that, Rich, I'll, I'll kick it over to you. Great, thanks, Dave. And hello, everybody. Thank you so much for having us here. Uh, we're really excited. And um, I'm really happy to be here with Eleanor. Eleanor have a, and I have a long relationship of doing cool things together. And this is just gonna be another one of those to add. Um, so I wanna start out real quick, just a little bit of background on, on our industry and then BC and how all this fits together. And so, you know, in our industry, um, it, it's, it's a massive industry, you know, 50 to $100 billion, depending on how you count it, of, of money being spent to develop infrastructure and environmental solutions. Uh, for communities all across uh, North America. Um, and what's interesting, there's two major things happening in our industry. One's been going on for about 20 years, which is changing the industry. Uh, that's called industry consolidation. And what that is, is that's 
bigger companies buying up little companies. And to give you an idea, uh, there's an organization that tracks the top um, 200 companies uh, in, in, in our industry, uh, 200 out of about 10,000. And these 200 companies have about 85 to 90% of the market share. And uh, so what's been happening is, is a lot of smaller firms um, have just been being gobbled up by these big private companies. Uh, I mean, I'm sorry, public companies, uh, because that's their growth strategy. That's what they do. Uh, you know, and it's, it's the uh, definition of capitalism to, to its finest. Uh, so that's one dynamic that's happening. And then the second more recently that's very interesting and I think fits well here is uh, we're seeing a paradigm shift in uh, what I'll call social and environmental responsibility. And for the longest time, uh, you know, it was, it was kind of like business was for, for capitalism. Business was for all about making money. And, and it was, you know, social and environmental responsibility was kind of kept off the side more to companies like Eleanor's, like nonprofits and local governments and NGOs and, and businesses would say, let them take care of that. We'll go you know, make our shareholders a bunch of money. And what started to happen over the last four to five years is uh, communities, people, shareholders, investors, folks like you, everyone's demanding that corporations actually have a responsibility in social and environmental matters. And uh, we're starting to see pressure on that and things like large public Investing firms are doing things like ESG, environmental, social, and governance um, matrices and, and grading scales. Uh, to, to, so, so it's not just looking at the financials of companies, but it's looking more at um, what are they doing uh, to be responsible and how can we grade them on that because that's becoming more and more important. And so with that background, a little bit about Brown and Caldwell in that we're a privately held employee-owned company. Uh, so we're not a publicly traded company. Our employees own the company. Uh, and I like to say that makes us different because we're purpose driven. And what does that mean? Our purpose is to have positive impact on our people, on our clients, the communities that we serve in the environment. And that's really what drives us. And if you go look at a lot of the other large publicly traded firms, they're doing a lot of great stuff, but it's a little bit different. They're owned by Wall Street or by investors and they have to return a profit to their shareholders. And those are people that aren't even involved in the company. So it just drives things differently. And if you look at a lot of their purpose statements, it might be to increase shareholder value, or it might be to be the largest company or the most global. Uh, and again, we're all about having positive impact. And that's also one of the reasons that we've uh, connected up with Water for People for so long, because trying to help them have the impact they have at bringing clean water uh, to uh, communities all around the world. Um, and now with that, being a purpose-driven company, there's two other things that are really important to us, our values. And our values, real quick, are wellness, service, integrity, teamwork, and excellence. And, and so we really believe that's who we are, and we make decisions based on those values. Uh, and I think that's a little bit different in today's world as well. Uh, but we, we really believe in those values, and we're trying to create a really special culture at Brown and Caldwell. Uh, so the decisions we make are based on our values. And then the other place that we go to is uh, if people ask, what is our strategy? Uh, our strategy is simply to be the company of choice. I know it's not super sexy. It's not like, you know, something secret to, you know, the Coke formula. But what does that mean? Clients that we serve, they all have a choice in who they work with. Uh, the bid that we go after for the most part, we have to compete for it. Um, and so we got to do everything we can to make our clients want to pick Brown and Caldwell. So everything that we do, the money and profit that we make as an employee owned company goes back into serving our clients as one half of it. The other half of that equation of being the company of choice is being the company of choice for people, for top talent. Uh, this industry is all about uh, delivering solutions to clients. And if you have the smartest and best and brightest people, you deliver really good solutions. Uh, and what's really unique is uh, I like to call this like a free agent market. If you're into sports, you know, free agents don't sign contracts. Um, so none of us have contracts, even me as the CEO and people vote with their feet. If they don't like a company, it's very easy to just go work somewhere else. So what are we doing as a company to make sure clients want to be working with Brown and Caldwell? And what are we doing uh, around the people side of it to create a really cool place that people want to be? Uh, and again, What's been really interesting is, is, is this industry consolidation because most all the companies that are in this space started out in the 40s with the purpose of 
having positive impact. But then what happened was as, as, as these engineering firms that were doing good became more of a business, we started to see an influx of people from overseas and other businesses that said, hey, this is a great business. We can make a lot of money in this business. And so there's a lot of CEOs now in our space that aren't even engineers or environmental people that have come in because they're management consultants or they're financial people. Uh, so it's changed that dynamic a little bit. Uh, I didn't say it earlier, but at Brown and Caldwell, where are we? Our size is about 1,700 people. We do close to half a billion dollars in revenue across the United States. And we're a mid-market firm. So we're not a tiny firm, but we're not one of the top five firms. Most of the top five firms are 30,000 to 60,000 people. Uh, we're number 34 on the list of the top 200. So again, it's a great place for us to be because we're small enough, small enough to be nimble, but big enough that we can have to go after any project that we want to help our clients. So that's a little bit about the company and how our, what our values and our purpose is. And later on, Dave, we can talk more about some of the decisions we make around that. Yeah, thanks, Rich. That, that was a great introduction. Uh, Eleanor, would you like to talk to us a little bit about Water for People? Sure, great. Thanks, Dave and Rich. Uh, a little bit of background. Uh, Rich and I used to work together for another consulting firm, and we sort of went our, to where we are today around the same time. So I left private sector and went to Water for People almost six years ago. And, and the reason I chose Water for People was because the founder of Water for People had been from the company we worked for back in 1991. So I grew up as a young engineer volunteering for Water for People back when it was a volunteer organization. And then sort of went my own way and did my own thing and, and, and moved many times and lost track of the organization a bit. And then when I moved back to Denver, uh, this opportunity came up and I had never planned to work for a nonprofit. I was a consultant and that's all I ever knew and that's all I was gonna be. But when I saw this, this uh, advertisement on LinkedIn, I said, oh my gosh, maybe this is, something I should try. And I just went for it on a very um, intuitive, opportunistic move and applied for the job. And uh, here I still am. So absolutely no regrets, but it, it's been quite a journey. And I'll share a little bit about some of the things that have really been important to me and I'm just comparing to private sector. So first of all, I love the work we do. I've always worked in water. And so I moved from basically designing huge infrastructure for cities and then managing businesses as, as um, Rich was talking about, he's the CEO, but I was a uh, regional manager of, for water businesses. So I did Latin American, then I did global. And so I was involved in all parts of the business. That's sort of like a mini CEO of a certain type of business in a certain region. Um, and then I got further and further away from actually doing the work and I started losing my own internal compass about what was really important to me. I wasn't seeing projects anymore. I was seeing angry clients. I was doing internal politics. And I thought, oh my gosh, this is all I ever wanted to do was run a global water business. And this is not motivating and I'm not adding any value to the world by the way either. And I'm making a big salary. So I didn't know what I was gonna do with myself until I saw that, that moment I saw the ad. So I apply for the job, I get the job obviously, and uh, still working in water, but really back to some of my roots, which were as a Peace Corps volunteer doing small community water systems. Yes, this was a Peace Corps on steroids. We have, we do, we do, our size is uh, actually mid-market. I'll, I'll use that term because we're used to mid-market nonprofit. So we're about 23 million in revenue. So we're not small, but we're not, we're not a plan international, save the children care, multi-sector, for the water sector, uh, we're kind of a number two tier. The biggest one in the water sector is water aid out of the UK. That's only a water sanitation hygiene. And then there are several of us around, you know, 20 to 50 million. They're about, they're about hundred million. Uh, so it's a pretty small world, much smaller than the engineering sector and lots of tiny, tiny nonprofits and lots of um, organizations that do multiple things and water is one of them. Uh, so I learned a lot about how complex nonprofits are. Actually, this is a lot more complicated than my job in consulting, totally different accounting. Um, and you don't deal directly with clients because one client might be rich, 
but my real client is who we're building water system for. So how do I meet the needs of the client who needs a service? But I have this person who's funding that and I'm in the middle. So you have many more stakeholders, many more um, opportunities for unsolicited impact and advice. Uh, and that, that I had no idea. And then the fundraising is a thousand times different than writing a proposal based on what I was used to qualifications, the last project I did, what made me great, uh, you know, not just me, my company great at engineering and problem solving, um, you know, a very clear selection process. Maybe there's a cost proposal or not. No, no, this is all about, you know, feelings, subject, subjectivity, emotional connection. Yeah, it's, and, and I love giving the pitch, like I would say for Water for People, because it's something I truly believe in. But the selection criteria, totally black box. So that is also something really different when you go into a mission-based you know, business, really. Now, on the flip side, everyone comes to work because they're there for the mission, not for the, making a ton of money, because they really feel like they're improving the quality of life for people around the world. Um, so those are some of the things that we have touch points. And the reason that, that Water for People is connected to um, Brown and Caldwell is we have a whole group of engineering partners. We call it the Leadership Council. So we, we were, we were, our founders were from two different engineering firms and American Water Works Association. But today we're partners with many, many firms in the industry. And it's, um, you know, connection directly to the business, obviously. Rich is working in water, wastewater, um, we say sanitation because we're not doing sewers. And that's a big thing I had to learn. We're not garbage collectors. We're talking about managing sludge and not wastewater. But water is pretty straightforward. It's about water dis collection, distribution, treatment, distribution. So that's very similar. Sanitation totally different. I'm a wastewater engineer. So I was like, whoa, this is really different. Um, but we still have treatment plants. It's just a lot thicker and a lot dirtier. Uh, so we have a lot of businesses like Brown and Caldwell that are connected to us because of the business, but also because of the mission and the employees who work for BC, and we'll hear from two of them today, but it's important for the companies and why they we have partnerships often. It's a way of having um, social responsibility, um, the CSR, but it's also about really working in an area that can have a social impact besides the projects. So it is pretty exciting for me to be able to be working with a lot of my former competitors and friends, but also really, you know, convening a group that's passionate about this mission that we have. And I love that. And that gets me out of bed every day. And it is really the partners we have in um, who, who provide the funding that we can do our work that allows us to do our work. So that is a nice way that I can stay connected to my past life and it's still relevant to my current life and really furthering um, getting people services around the world. Pass back to you, Dave. Thanks, Eleanor. I appreciate that. It's a great introduction. Hey, I just realized I forgot to do something at the, at the beginning of this talk and I would just like to uh, do a land acknowledgement here that we are, we're all spread across a number of different places, but us, us here in Colorado at least, we are on the ancestral lands of, of the Sioux or the Lakota Nation, the Cheyenne, uh, the Ute, Mountain Ute, and the Southern Ute. So I was gonna do that as part of the introduction. Um, I'm really surprised my daughter didn't remind me. Um, but anyway, um, with that, Rich, could you please talk a little bit about uh, some of the tough decisions you've had to make based upon values and ethics? Yeah, we, we could spend the whole day going over tough decisions around that. And, and I got three examples just to, to kind of give examples of how, um, you know, corporations can, can make right decisions um, based on, uh, it's not all about pure capitalism, right? That there's, there's, company, there's, there's different um, layers of companies when it comes to making money and, and what they do with that money. Um, but again, for us, uh, I think the thing that's really important and for any of you that are looking for a company to work for is um, companies have strategy and then they have their culture and their values. And uh, where problems happen is, is when strategy and culture and values don't align. Uh, so you have to find a company where those make sense, right? So it's a strategy you believe in, a culture you believe in, and they're set up for success. Because 
it's really easy to say the right thing today. Um, you know, just take uh, diversity and inclusion. Uh, we, we brand everything different at Brown and Caldwell. So we have our own terms. Our term is called balance and belonging. Um, if you went to any board at any company, private, uh, public, and you ask them, is, is balance and belonging, diversity and inclusion important for you and your strategy? Who would say no? You know, you'd have to be an idiot in the climate today to say no. Um, so everyone's going to say yes, but it's the actions that matter, the companies that actually take actions that are doing some things. And earlier I was giving a, a you know, some, some differences between a private firm and a public firm. And I do want to say that, uh, you know, there's public firms in our space that do wonderful things. Like Eleanor said, they support water for people in other areas. Uh, it's just a different ownership model. And, and you have to take that into, a, into account. And so for us, we do what we think is right for our clients and our people. We don't answer to anybody else. Um, we have to make a fair profit so that we can invest uh, in the company itself. Um, but we're not sending money outside and we don't have that other group of stakeholders that complicates things. We do what we think is right. Um, so three, one quick example about that. It's not always all about money. Um, and, uh, you know, we, we were working with a mining client, a large mining client, uh, and we had one of the, one of three contracts. It was the only three contracts. It's called a master services agreement with this client, uh, which is basically a license to hunt, to go work with that client, get as much work as you can. And they had a ton of work. Um, the problem was we weren't getting any of it, um, even though we had this contract. And so we went to the client and asked them, you know, what can we do differently um, to get more work with you? And they said, you don't have the right people. You need to go hire somebody like this person over here. Well, we went to this person over here and we hired them. And we brought them into the company. And I've never seen anything like this in 29 years. The respect that this client had for this person, um, we got, you know, within six to eight months, about $3 million worth of new business with this client which is a lot of money for a client, especially in six months after hiring somebody. We were all excited, all happy, because now our strategy is working, we're growing, we can make a fair profit to invest in our people and our clients and give back to our, the communities that we serve. Um, but guess what? I uh, started noticing that um, people left this person's office crying. You know, they, they were just like, devastated. Um, and as we started to look into this, this person was not acting to our values. They weren't representing our values. They were a very senior person, very command and control, uh, and they thought they could do whatever they wanted because they were bringing $3 million worth of business into the company. Uh, and we worked real hard with this person um, to coach them, to explain to them what we expect, uh, to make sure they had the tools that they needed to, to act in the right way. And at the end of the day, I ended up having to fire this person. Uh, because um, they weren't living up to our values. And, and it was hypocritical to say uh, our values are important to us, uh, but it doesn't matter. You don't have to follow the values if you bring a lot of money in for the firm. And it really hurt us because it took us about five years to get back up to the level of that revenue. So it hurt us from a revenue standpoint, but in terms of the morale standpoint and, and in terms of employees believing in that we're true about what we say about our values, it really helped there, right? People couldn't believe that we were willing to let somebody like that go because they weren't a good cultural fit and they didn't believe in our values. So that's one example. Uh, another example is just, again, I'm gonna, you're gonna see me pivot private versus public because of these, these shareholder requirements. Uh, but just take COVID for the last year. Um, because of COVID, nobody's traveling and a huge expense for um, engineering companies like ours and the bigger ones is the travel of employees going between countries, going between cities, moving people around, having dinners with clients, setting up teams to be successful. Um, and so when you take that um, you know, out of the equation where we're forced to not travel, all of us got a really large windfall uh, of money because we weren't spending it. Um, it was built into our cost structure and we weren't having to pay that kind of money. For Brown and Caldwell, that attuned to about $5 million um, which is nearly 25 to 30% of the profit we make on any given year. So it's a big amount of money, uh, but everybody was seeing this money. And if you start to watch, what, what did people do with that money? So what, what did we do with it? Uh, we gave every employee a $1,500 COVID relief fund. Um, you know, you don't think that that's a lot. $1,500 helped a lot of people multiply it out by 1,700. It's almost $3 million that we gave back to our people because they're the ones that were doing the work to make this stuff happen. 
Uh, we also double down on some of the uh, um, organizations that we support, like Water for People. Uh, they, they asked us if we could step up in certain places to help them with some funding, and we were able to do that. Uh, we also invested a ton of money back into uh, safety and ergonomics for our people, because now everybody's working at home, uh, and we didn't want people to start getting hurt because they don't have the right number of monitors or a keyboard or a desk. Um, so what we did is, you know, we gave back because that's what we do, because we're a people-driven company. And again, nothing against um, the public traded companies, but what did they do with that money? You can go look this up. I'm not making this up. Just nearly every one of them started buying their stock back. Okay, why do they buy their stock back? Because it makes their stock price go up, right? Because they have this third stakeholder that they have to worry about. So instead of taking care of the people that are taking care of our clients and, and you know, they have to, this other stakeholder they have to manage. And so instead of spending $5 million on making people's lives better, it was easier for them to spend $5 million to buy you know, or a lot more to buy that stock back. So again, I mean, these are decisions that, that you have to make. And so finding, finding the right um, companies uh, that fit well with their strategy uh, and their culture, it's really important and good companies exist out there. You can go work for a company that's a for-profit um, that has a set of values that are consistent with what you believe in. And again, if, you know, it's gonna be great to hear from Angela and Savannah, but um, we have a lot of folks out there that they come here because they wanna make a positive impact, right? That's our purpose. And they know that they can reach their full potential and be developed in the decisions that we're making as a company. Yes, we have to make a fair profit, but because we're privately held, everything we make goes back into the company. And because we're employee owned, you know, I'm the CEO, but you know, I, I don't even own the most of the company. There's people that have been here 30 years that have a larger share in the company than I do. So, you know, it's not like the, the rich keep getting richer and the few that run the company, you know, if we do well, we, we make a bunch of money. We all kind of rise together because we all are shareholders of this company. We all own a little piece of the rock. Um, and together, when we're profitable, it allows us to reinvest that money to make those decisions consistent with our value. And Dave, one last thing I'll just say, because, you know, this, this paradigm that I talked about of, um, you know, the, the intersection of, of social and environmental responsibility becoming part of strategy, we're lucky because that's who our company's been for a long time, but we haven't been intentional about it. And so one of the things that we've decided to do here recently, being more intentional is there's three areas that we're doubling down in. And so one is diversity and inclusion. Uh, you know, we've hired a uh, head of diversity and inclusion. We've never had that before because that's a field in itself and we need an expert to help guide us. Um, we're investing in underserved communities to bring uh, different types of people into the workforce that maybe didn't think about coming into engineering. Um, and, and then of course, we, we've invested a lot within our company um, to, to make sure that people are being treated fairly and equally and that everybody has uh, an opportunity to reach their full potential at Brown and Caldwell. Uh, so, so that's one of the legs. The other one is uh, this giving back that we do to, to really be intentional about it. We're creating this uh, organization called the BC Foundation. Uh, a lot of our giving right now is locally. We do corporate giving like to water for people, but we figured that if we can harness the power of our 1700 employees and, and funnel it into a BC foundation, which we can also fund in a different way that we can have larger impact. And then the third leg of that stool is um, the ESG, you know, so um, um, the, the corporate um, responsibility, uh, sustainability, responsibility, corporate social responsibility, whatever buzzword you wanna use that's, that's out there today. Um, again, we've been okay at it, but let's be intentional. We're, we're consulting with a lot of companies to help them understand, um, you know, how they can be more uh, responsible, but let's make sure that we got our backs covered, right? Like, should, let's say, make sure that we're actually doing like, you know, preaching, not just preaching, but doing what we preach as well. So those three areas are things that we're doing. And what's been really interesting is I talked to fellow CEOs. Um, not everybody is like that. You know, not every company, like just take uh, some of the social issues we faced in this past year, George Floyd and, and, and um, uh, how that's kind of swelling up into bringing awareness around a very important cause, or even just recently the riots. Um, you know, we're always communicating with our people about that, giving them an outlet to communicate because we want them to bring their full self to work. Uh, I've talked to a lot of our um, uh, competing CEOs and they're like, we tell, we keep that at home, right? We're here to do water work projects, environmental projects, 
uh, permitting projects, you know, we don't want to talk about, uh, you know, social equity because we're an engineering firm. And I think that's a short-sighted uh, view and that this is all coming together now. So uh, again, uh, a lot of tough decisions you make, but if you have your North Star and you believe in it and you act on it and you make your decisions like we do, some of the examples I gave you where we're actually putting our money where our mouth is, employees see that and appreciate that. And uh, uh, I think it, it's a win-win for us, our clients, our employees and our communities and environment. Thanks, Rich. And, and I will say that I have appreciated how you personally have um, come forward and addressed some of those social issues throughout the year. Um, you know, st and, and starting with COVID, I think we've been really um, straightforward with our employees about, um, you know, how, how we're, how we're going to approach that and with some of the, the social equity issues also. And we've had some uh, good discussions here um, in in, in some of the, the, the teams that we have about, about those issues. They, have, they haven't been swept underneath the rug. So I think it's been great. Eleanor, would you like to talk a little bit about ethics and value and some of the tough decisions you've had to make? Yeah, there's so many choices, but I picked a few to share, a few gems. Uh, so first I'll talk about equity and inclusion from, how, from our world. You know, it's similar but different as most things. So we have two parts to our program. We, one is called actually equity inclusion. It's part of our programming. So for us, it's uh, about reaching everyone forever, but, but it's an it, uh, enhanced focus on reaching women and mostly disabled because we work you know, with the world, the most vulnerable. They're, they're not even good roads out there. So a lot of times uh, disabled members of the communities are just locked in the house and they, they can't get out and, they, um, and the women and girls. So this goes into toilet design, especially um, menstrual hygiene management, access to community toilets for wheelchairs, if you're lucky enough to have one, uh, changing rooms. So really taking that into design of the programs, but also getting women into the decision-making roles in the community water committees or the water and sanitation offices and getting training to women to be leaders in their communities. So that's a bit on the programmatic side. And, and we had been a bit ad hoc about it, really driven by the country, uh, director of what they wanted to do and their country program, but now we're really creating more of a overall goals and targets for the organization, no matter what country you're in. Internally, uh, we call our program JEDI, Justice, Equity, Diversity, Inclusion. So this is uh, a look in the mirror. Also, we were on this journey, you know, albeit a bit slow. It was sort of along with many other initiatives we were doing, but then really ramped up, of course, with uh, Black Lives Matter and George, George Floyd, et cetera. And, and similar to what Rich said, we don't work in the US even, but we took the time to just stop work and reflect. And our US employees were really distracted and distraught about the racial equity in the US. And you know what is our role, even though we're a US organization, but we're not here, do we have a role to play in some of these things happening in our own country? Or how does this reflect globally? So really taking the time to say, look in the mirror and say, okay, the world's changing. We need to change ourselves. And some of the, some of the things happening in the nonprofit sector, and you may hear, hear these terms, but it, it's um, like increasing legitimacy in the countries where we work, making sure our local leaders have the right amount of influence and, and power to, to be leaders in their countries and not beholden on the, the headquarters in the US. You know, we don't want that. But that also leads into increasing voice of our employees from the global south on our, our well, countries, obvious, we don't have any expats, but our regional teams also now we have no expats. So we've been through it, going through evolution. Now we got to get our global leadership more, to, you know, more inclusive of the global south. So we're working on this decentralization movement internally and increasing inclusion and voice of, of the uh, operating countries. And the decolonization is another word that's thrown around a lot in, in nonprofits. I mean, nonprofits. They, you know, our traditional charities and give money away are generally from the north, right? That's where the money is. And like giving money to the south, well, that's sort of like, what's going on here? So we're just really looking at how do we best use the money to the and best use it to the way we should in our country, but also keeping our donors happy. So we're, we're sometimes the donors care, sometimes they don't care and they don't understand, you know, why would you do that? So having, um, changing ourselves, explaining why we're doing that, really 
making us a better organization and with a stronger voice and being globally legitimate, but also locally legitimate. We call it twin citizenship. So it's a bit complicated, but feels right. And kind of undoing a lot of our legacy. Uh, and this goes with our board as well, right? So we have to figure out a way to make our board more representative of the global South. So that's a big thing happening right now for us. Um, I would say on some of the decisions and how we spend our money. So examples of just on how we make sure we're doing it in the right way. So we do have uh, like a donor acceptance policy, we call it, who we, who we do accept money from. And then how we make sure we're accountable, how we spend the money. We work in some of the poorest countries in the world that are highly corrupt, lack of transparency, places that a lot of people choose absolutely not to work, but that is where the services are needed. So we, we are really careful on how we um, track our money so we can report back to our donors. But some of the things that have come up with decisions, hard decisions are um, mining. A lot of you work in mining or somehow connected. We work with indigenous communities and some have been really impacted negatively by mining. So we have had to make certain decisions in, in cases that we can't accept that money because you know, our, our, our employees would say, what are you doing? No, this is, this is not the money that we should use to further our mission. So we've had to say no to some, some funding and just um, you know, being respectful of the dynamic in, in some of our countries. Others are um, how the money is actually spent. So in some countries, we actually are the, what we call the implementer. We actually you know, build the infrastructure and our own employees oversee that work. In some countries, we have partners we work with. So we actually subgrant to a local partner. And the further you get away from control, the more risk opens up. So we've had a couple instances, and I'll mention two. One was an um, internal whistleblower said, you know, there's some fishy stuff going on and the country director is not paying attention. And so we had to do a forensic audit and like, you know, take those allegations and follow the thread and hire someone to do, um, you know, sleuthing to figure out what was the real story here. Now, some of the allegations were just a personal grievance against a person, but some, you know, were kind of sloppy. We didn't find anything that was totally bad, but there are definitely things we can you know, make tighter. And we have our own internal audit program. We do this with some regularity, but this was super specific in certain areas. So we take the time, anytime that we have an ethics hotline, any employee can call at any time about someone internally or externally. And we will, we take those very seriously. Um, so we do a forensic audit and sometimes, and then we've had to let in a different country, someone said, you know, this partner, we've had him for a long time, but there's something going on with this, this delivery partner. And we did another investigation. Sure enough, we're like, we can't work with you anymore. You're not following our flow down conditions, essentially, that we the work we want you to do and the standards, you're not doing that. We can't do this anymore. So we had to let go of a longtime partner and, and find someone else. The last um, example I'll give is something that's very recent. Um, we don't do emergency response or we're not humanitarian. We have long-term programs that we build permanent infrastructure. This year, for those who've been following what's um, Central America hurricanes, we had two hurricanes in a row that hit Central America. And for us, Guatemala was okay, Nicaragua was okay, but our Honduras program like severely affected. So the back-to-back -back, uh, hurricanes destroyed many years of work and about $6 million of infrastructure that we put in over the years. Now our budget for infrastructure this year is $100,000. We're like, what do we do? Dilemma, right? So. Well, we can't, do we go back and rebuild all that infrastructure with money that well, we don't have right now? And, and that would be what we take away from new build somewhere else. Do we just leave the country? We just said like, this is like, we can't do this anymore. Or do we figure out a way to follow through and be true to our commitments to the, these uh, communities and get their services back and then set up a, um, a fund? Obviously this is the one we're doing that's specifically to emergencies for unexpected climate emergencies, essentially, for the work we do that impacts our commitments. So we have a strategic investment fund that's forward-looking. So at one point we said, well, let's use the strategic investment fund to rebuild. Well, no, that's not a strategic investment. This is a reactive investment. So that's not the right use of strategic investment. We need to have a fund that can respond to natural disasters when it impacts our progress. So we're setting that up now, and I'm sure there are gonna be more because um, the way things are going, there are more and more climate emergencies. 
But that was a, a very interesting ethical decision. Do we take the money from strategic fund? Do we not do anything? Do we find money from other um, that were earmarked for something else and that use it for this because this is more urgent? But that's not what we said we'd use that money for. We can't do that. So we can't, we've come to this point where we're doing a new investment um, plan. We ought to present it to the board and they have to approve it. So it gives you some idea of some of our decisions we make. Thanks, Eleanor. That, that's really interesting. I, I found it um, interesting listening to both you and Rich that there was this thread of intentionality. It was like we have these programs in place, right? But this moment has made us more aware of the extent of the problem. And we've really had to, like, in Rich's word, double down and be more intentional about how we meet some of these goals. And I, I was also surprised, you know, just I, I would assume that a, 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 a a company like yours, Eleanor, that that works across so many countries would just be the most diverse company that you could imagine. But you still had to think about it and make sure you're doing it right. So, um, what I'd like to do real quick is just to allow um, our young professionals to comment, and then we'll open it up for um, for questions. So, Savannah or Angela, would you like to just? See anything from your perspective in terms of working at BC and, and, and what you heard Rich say that anything rang true or you want to call him out and say, no, that's not the way we're doing it? <laughs> <laughs> oh, well, thanks, Dave. And this has just been such a pleasure to be invited to this. And it's really lovely to contribute. So just a, a little bit about me before I comment further, just so the, the group here understands where I came from and where I am now. At, in my career at Brown and Caldwell. So I'm a geologist by education and I spent many years uh, supervising subcontractors and collecting the data that's needed in order to help our clients with their site remediation and their compliance and permitting. However, I became really passionate about the people side and helping connect the dots between the technical and providing that service, that best value that we've talked a little bit about here here on this call. So it's it's really important for me to be intentional with my clients to help them understand what their needs are and help them manage their sites in a way that is not only going to be beneficial for them long term, but beneficial for the planet. So with that said, it's it's really been a joy to be a part of Brown and Caldwell. And we talked about culture quite a bit uh, earlier on this call. Thank you, Rich. And I, I liked the story that he brought up about a, a particular client and opportunities and bringing somebody into the company that may not have been the right fit. And to me, this is one of the reasons that this culture is so strong here is we, we, are, we are intentional. And one thing also I want to, uh, to highlight here is uh, Rich's comment about the social justice. I think that that was so important to identify that there's an evolution going on with the way that we interact with each other as, as humans and as a global community. It's not just about making money. It's about making sure that we're taking care of people, of all people, because we're all part of the environment here. So I just wanted to mention that. And with that said, Savannah, I'll let you say a little bit about yourself. Thanks, Angela. Um, yes, I introduced myself a little bit earlier, but I was a grad student at Mines and um, went directly pretty much from Mines to Brown and Caldwell as my first consulting job and um, wasn't really sure what to expect. You know, I'm a young professional, so I'm not as much client facing. Um, but the, the office dynamics, you know, I hear horror stories from my colleagues about situations that they've been in that uh, they had no support from their higher ups or their higher ups were the problem. And I feel like Brown and Caldwell has many, many steps to avoid that. I feel very comfortable, if not that it's happened, but if something did happen to me, I feel very comfortable reaching out to my supervisor, reaching out to the people I work with. Um, I, yeah, and it's just a very open, everyone's open to discuss many things outside of work. Like you both said, the social, issues along with the work issues, you can't separate the two. I mean, when things are happening, I'm constantly refreshing my browser at work. What, what's going on? What the presidential election, the debate, what's happening? 
you know, it's, it's impossible to fully separate the two. So um, I think it's great that at Brown and Caldwell, we talk about that stuff because it's part of our lives. It's part of our work day. So um, yeah, that's about it for what I have. Thanks, Savannah and Angela. Those were both great summaries. Um, Elizabeth, um, or Beth, do you, do you want to um, like ask the first question or do you have a question from the students that you maybe have picked up from monitoring the chat? Let's see. Uh, well, I'm going to, to voice a question from Professor Smith actually while the rest of you start thinking. Um, which is when you think about, um, let's see, when you think about what you assumed um, would be a public business or a private business, what different kinds of sectors would be like, how has, has your experience with, with Brown Caldwell or Water for People uh, enforced that or, or undermined that? Well, I'll start by saying that I've never worked for a public firm. I've only worked at Brown and Caldwell since I graduated from college. So I have heard though, uh, some of the different challenges that come from, from both sides. But for me, it's so important to feel that I have ownership in the services that I'm providing and the clients that we're pursuing and the success stories that I hear that comes from a firm like Brown and Caldwell. So for me, it's more of that ownership because before I entered into industry at all, the planet was my, my biggest priority. I mean, for me, I've always been really passionate about understanding of how humans are interacting with this planet and how can I help make it better. So for me, it's that the feeling of ownership. I'd like to comment on that because I worked for a large publicly held firm before I came here and I had an operational role. And, you know, I can't tell you how many times I heard the word, one, one meeting specifically really sticks out, you know, if you can't make this number, we'll find somebody who can. And I've never heard that type of language as a manager at Brown and Caldwell. And the other thing that has never happened to me that happened to me at my former employee is getting a call on Monday saying, your overhead's out of whack, you need to cut X people by Friday, give me your list by Thursday. So those are kind of the experience. And, and look, I've worked at another firm before that, that is now a publicly firm, publicly traded firm that wasn't like that at all. So to Rich's point, I'm not trying to paint the broad brush and saying all publicly traded firms are bad. Um, but I did have some really uh, different experiences at my pre previous employer than, than I've had here. Yeah, Dave, you know, the, the duality of that question is, is, is interesting from a standpoint of, um, it's funny when you said that, when I was thinking about, I work for a, a private, uh, publicly traded company and, you know, I'd be walking down in the cafeteria headquarters and everybody asked me the same question and I didn't get it for a while, but it was, how's your number? Where's your number? And it's all about the number, right? You know, and um, and and so you know there was there wasn't conversations about the things that we were doing. How are the people? How are the clients? How's how's that aligning? But then mm -hmm. on the other side, when I you know, and, and it's funny too. When I I was so drilled into that kind of mindset uh, when I was interviewing at Brown and Caldwell, you know, I had a question for them. I'm like, you know, so if I come here, what's my number going to be? You know, if you, I'm going to come here to run this part of this business, what's my number? And they're like, look at me, like what? And then finally, they said, okay, you're asking previous CEOs, it sounds like you're asking what we expect, because it's real simple. We expect you to take care of our people and take care of our clients. And we found that if you do those two things, the numbers work out. Now, again, we, we're not farmers, you know, we're very sophisticated in what we do. And when I said duality, when I first got here, it was really frustrating because um, we weren't performing from a, a profit standpoint the way that we should have been. And it was hurting us. And so as I started talking to people about need the need to increase our profitability, the first kind of rumor that went out there was, oh, this new guy, Rich, he wants to sell the company, right? He's trying to fatten us up like a pig and take us to slaughter. And it, it took me two and a half years to keep talking to people to say, no, the best way to stay private, the best way to enable our mission, our purpose of giving back, of having impact is to make the fair profit that the industry demands, right? So, so 
what we've done, I think the biggest part in the last five years is showing the people of the company that you can do both. You can make a fair profit um, and you can also be focused on people, environment and climate and, and do good things. They're not mutually exclusive. It's not pick one or the other. Uh, the nature of a publicly traded company, it's a much shorter time frame. It's quarter by quarter. Mm -hmm. And the decisions that you're talking about depend on how that quarter's going. Whereas, you know, someone might come to us and say, Angela, uh, the project she was working on got canceled. Um, she's not going to have work for a couple of weeks. We can say, well, wow, she's a great employee. So let's get her working on something that we need done inside the company and we'll find her work and we'll pay her overhead for a month because of the value that she provides to the company and to our clients. That's really hard to do uh, in the, in the, I mean, Eleanor knows she, she worked for one of the bigger ones and I'm sure she has the same stories. Yeah, very similar. I mean, I was on the hot seat for those uh, quarterly investor calls and they were to the hundred decimal point, which always made me laugh, like, really? And then, you know, pressured to say, you know, what are you going to do in the next three months? Can you, can you promise us that? Well, no. And you know, my business, water, I mean, it's like municipal sectors, slow and conservative. And yeah, we get it's good in the long haul, but the margins are lower in the short term. And most of the other businesses were um, not government sector. So it was, I was always having to try to explain that. And um, yeah, it was a lot of pressure for the short term. And then the long term strategic vision was nice and on the shelf. But uh, I remember one meeting, I got yelled at for talking about people too much. I was like, <laughs> ah, this maybe isn't the place for me. Again, lots of, other companies are great, and there were also really great things about um, the ability to have, you know, we were in an M&A mode, so acquiring business all around the world. That was really fun and really cool, and my job was to build a global team with five different companies plus the legacy company and figure out the brand and the value proposition and, like, the statement of qualifications. That was really cool. Yeah. Nice but stuff. there wasn't money to invest in, you know, a person sitting on overhead for more than a couple of weeks and, you know, things that I had been used to for a long-term vision. So it all depends. Okay. I, I think one thing worth mentioning is what was really different for me coming to Water for People was um, just that constant pressure fundraising. I was used to big contracts, put a ton of energy in for several months, you win a big deal and you work on it for several years. I mean, you, you might work on the proposal, positioning and qualifying and, and winning. It might take several years as well, but then you got a long run. No, this is like an everyday thing that we got going on here. And it is like, it is really hard. So I have a whole team of fundraisers, but it's still, um, it's relentless pressure. And that is something I had no idea about. Like, I didn't know how hard that is. And people go through, get burnt out, pretty, you know, there's a churn on that team because it's really a lot of pressure. And you feel like when you're on the fundraising team, I know this because they tell me this too. And I actually feel this a lot because, you know, about a good 30% of my job is closing deals or making introductions. It's just like the pressure that everyone's salary is on you and that you got to, you're, you're in the critical path for making people's livelihoods. And so that is really stressful. But on the up flip side, when you bring in that money, you feel really like you're doing a great service. So I would just say that's one thing that I really um, felt very naive about and have learned a lot. So there's so, a lot there that I'd love to, to follow up on, but I wanna make sure to ask um, the question that I really like to ask and make sure it gets asked in every, um, in every colloquium. Um, and because I think that, uh, Eleanor, I think you brought this up a little bit, um, thinking through what's a humanitarian intervention and what isn't, right? So um, here we have, and I, I really do direct your attention to the chat. If we, if we stick around a little bit longer, we'll, we'll make sure to bring those in. Um, but here we're very concerned with what humanitarian engineering and science is from our different perspectives and what it could be. So I just, I, we would love to get your take on that. What is, what could humanitarian engineering and science mean? What should it mean? You're asking me, right? I'm asking all of you, you could go oh. first. I think that you're probably <laughs> gonna be the, the you were the, the closest to, to speaking. So I think your, um, all your colleagues are doing the not it thing. Yeah, 
I, start. I, I mean, that's a great question. And, and it would be, I'll, you know, could go any many different ways. But what we end up talking a lot about at Water for People is we're building a long-term service is our, is our mission. And we want to be able to uh, train people who you know, take the ownership of that service. We transfer the assets. We want to make sure that the management structures, the governance structures, and the rate structures, asset management structures are in place so we can go away. So we want to, um, we have that long view and it's not about, um, you know, we have a lot of discussions about point of use water purification versus a distribution system with high quality water. And we're into that, we're into the, the long-term investment and the life cycle costing. So we, we touch on the edge of, of that all the time. We work near a refugee camp. Should we go to the refugee camp? That's not really humanitarian. They've lived their whole lives in that camp. Can't we make better infrastructure there? And then this whole thing with Honduras was interesting to us. So I think that the definition varies, but what we try to do at Water for People is when we make decisions like what is, are we providing that long-term service or are we a short-term fix? And we want to be the long-term service. All right, thank you. Does anybody else have any other thoughts on this? I have a thought, I don't know if it's appropriate, but I'll say it anyways. <laughs> you know, it, it's, all of this, and, and I'm and I'm very narrow in my in my experience here. This is U.S. based, so I, I don't have the, the wide range of experience that Eleanor has. But even in the United States, um, it's it's really interesting. I mean, water equity is a really big issue uh, to our clients. Um, you know, do, does everybody have equal access to clean water here in the United States? I mean, the work that Eleanor is doing that's a whole other level. Um, but you know, there's pockets of um, you know where shutoffs occur because people don't have jobs and where poverty is. And it's really interesting. And, and the reason I was saying, I don't know if I should say this, is that in the United States, water environmental comes down to politicians. It's not separate. It's very hard to separate that. And in order for us to do the right things that we know we can do, there has to be money, there has to be funding. And, and it takes very brave politicians to be able to say, you know, we're gonna raise rates in these areas that can afford them so that we can then provide services to areas that need it. Um, it's very rare to find a politician. You know, I, I can tell you hundreds of stories where we have an incredible solution, we're talking through it, they're all behind it. And then the second we say, you're gonna have to raise rates. They're like, yeah, I, I wanna get elected next year. So where I was afraid to go is that there's these self-servings. I mean, I can count on this hand five times where a politician would call me up and say, I just got elected. We got four years to do the right thing. Um, let's get it done because there's no way they're, hired, they're gonna vote me back in because of what I'm gonna do to do the right thing. That's a major issue and I don't know how to solve that, right? I don't know because it's, 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 it's again, it's um, the people that have the power, the people that want the power, um, they don't put the communities first for the most part, it's more about self-preservation. And, and, and even though we can do a lot of really cool things at our level, at Eleanor's level, we need a fundamental shift in the, the political system, you know? I mean, I mean, think about like um, water quality uh, and how that's decided. I mean, the EPA has a hundred chemicals as, uh, that's it. It's been a hundred chemicals on their list of bad chemicals for the last, since, since the Clean Water Act came out. Um, you mean to tell me we haven't developed a whole bunch of new chemicals? The only time that it happens is when there's a problem, a problem is discovered all of a sudden. Like we, don't, we don't test the new chemicals that go out to see what happens when they get in the environment. So there, there's, there's a lot of fundamental shifts that I think have to happen. And then just another big one for us in the water industry is, um, again, it's, I'm going to call it self-preservation. Uh, the, the electric utilities, uh, there's 3,000 electric utilities in the United States. Um, does anyone know how many water utilities, clean water utilities provide drinking water? Anyone wanna guess about how many water utilities there are? There's, there's over 55,000 water utilities and every one of those water utilities has a board um, and they want local control. And it's one of the most inefficient processes you've ever seen. Because, you know, and so instead of uh, consolidating that, and creating large entities where you can get economies of scale, where you can pick up the, 
you know, the, the rural area that doesn't have the best drinking water quality and put them into the big city one because you expand that thing. We could do so much good around that. Um, but, you know, what has to happen is like, here, I'll give you a real life example. In Northern California, there's a new regulation coming out around nutrients, uh, too much phosphorus in water, too much nitrogen. And for each one, there's four individual communities that would each have to spend about 40 to $50 million to upgrade their individual wastewater plants. We could build a regional plant, um, pull all four of those communities together, build one plant to treat all that. Um, and it sounds like a great idea until the politics get engaged because what happens is, is each one of those four, com four communities has 10 people on the board of the water board. And to create one regional one, we would have to go from 40 board members to 10. Who wants to give their spot up? So they don't do what's right for the community. And what's going to happen is they're going to spend what's the four times 30 or what, you know, 50. They're going to spend 200 to 250 million dollars to solve a problem that could cost. And this is real money. This is real stuff that happens today. Um, and it, 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 it's very frustrating uh, because of the system, right? The, the, so I don't know if there's anything we can do to create, you know, oh. the young people's minds to, to change this. You know, maybe it's political engineering that really needs to be. Uh, focus on. I think one of the most impactful things you can do as a young person, and we, we've had a couple of MEMers do it, is, is join those boards, become involved in local politics, um, you know, um, and, and take it from a different point of view that's, you know, not just about self-preservation. Yeah. Um, I want to be respectful. One last thing just to say again, I yeah. mean, there's incredible clients that we have out there that do the right thing. Uh, there, there's so many great examples of, um, of, of where there is positive change happening. Uh, it's just not um, pervasive enough right now. Uh, and we yeah. need a, a systematic mindset shift to really reach the potential that we could have to have a lot of humanitarian impact across the United States alone. You know, and think about it, if we can't do it here, you know, I don't know. I want to be respectful of your time, Rich, Eleanor, Angela, and Savannah. Um, we, we scheduled this for an hour, and then we, we told the students there's an optional half hour to stay and discuss what, what um, we've been talking about. So you're welcome to say, stay, but I know you're all busy professionals. You may still have work to do tonight. <laughs> um, so uh, I'll, I'll leave it up to you whether or not you uh, participate in, in, in our last half hour. I'm going to have to sign off. I do have to work on something still, but it's been great to be here. Thank you for the invitation. And yeah. I see there's some more questions in the chat that I'd be happy to answer. Maybe we can do something offline to get some of those answers for you. Okay. I'll, I'll work on getting you some of those questions if you're okay with that, Eleanor. Sure. It'd be great. Thank you. Yeah. All right. Good night. Thanks, everyone. Yeah. So there's been some great stuff in the chat that if people want to stick around, um, I, I would like to hear more about, oh wait, that was to Eleanor. Um, let's see. Sorry, Beth, do you have anything? I, I haven't been monitoring. Oh, there was something from Juan about the Texas disasters, maybe changing the view about politicians getting elected versus raising rates. Do you have any? Any perspective on that, Rich? No, I don't. Um, <laughs> you know, but again, I mean, things like that happen. And, and uh, again, there's a lot of people doing the right thing. I don't know if, if, I don't know a lot about the Texas situation. I mean, that's in the energy space. We don't really play in the energy right. space. And right. there's so much going on in the environmental space that I'm, I'm overly focused there right now. Um, you know. But I mean, I think, you know, that's unfortunately like think about, okay, water. So what's one of the big things that changed the way we think about lead, right? It was the Flint, Michigan situation, yeah. Yeah. right? That's a great case study um, for anyone because that's another situation where um, they knew about that public health crisis, but because of the political things that we spoke about earlier, there were some decisions and things and actions taken that, you know, they probably wouldn't take knowing that they were going to be exposed. That's all I'll say on that one. But, yeah. um, you know, so, so sometimes it takes a catastrophe or a disaster to raise, you know, awareness to, to make change. 
Anybody else have a question or comment, Beth? I think the, uh, Nina has a great question that okay. I'll read. I hope she's still here. Um, she asks if BC was always so value driven. So going back to your example of the employee that brought a lot of financial benefits but was uh, detrimental to morale. She asks, how can a company be sort of take action on their values and be held accountable for their values if there are those immediate and sometimes dire financial or like numbers problems? It's a really good question. Um, so th the first one's easy. As long as I've known BC, it's been a value driven company. Um, you know, a lot, all these companies, you know, the companies that are 60,000 people and the companies that are a thousand people, they all started out at the same size. Um, and in, in the companies that tended to be more on the value driven side, they all, we all kind of grew about the same rate. And then um, the ones that really got into the quote business aspects of it, you know, they, they took off. Um, and so I, I think that there's a handful of companies that have always been uh, value driven. Uh, not to say again that a large firm can't be value driven. It's just hard with that third stakeholder, the, the public. Um, the other question though about actionable. So, so first of all, you know, uh, you have to do things that make business sense or you won't be in business, right? That, that's just, you know, you know but, 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 okay, if you take sustainability for a long time, um, and I'm gonna, I'm gonna pick on the chemical industry for a second. Uh, I have a lot of really close friends at Dow and DuPont. I, I, I uh, spent many years, um, they would make crazy stuff that people needed. And then I would try to figure out how to biologically break it down so that it wouldn't harm the environment. So we had a good partnership, we needed each other. Um, but one of the things that was really interesting is, is that, you know, that when sustainability first came out, um, they, they, put, they put a lot of money into it and they put a lot of uh, effort into defining what sustainability looked like to them and what it was gonna be. Uh, and they didn't focus on the business aspects of it. And it never really went anywhere, right? And so as, 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 um, as I was talking to these folks and learning from them and helping them, um, where it started to take off is when they made it all about good business sense, right? So, um, you know, improving your supply chain, um, choosing different chemicals that are less impactful to the environment on the front end, it saves you money. It's the right thing to do. It's not just the right thing to do, but it actually makes business sense. And all of a sudden, when they started to put the business side of it into place, that's when really good things happen. Okay, just take... Again, I'll go back to diversity and inclusion. Um, you're all in academia. I mean, I could give you one of any 20 um, uh, reports that show that diverse teams outperform non-diverse teams, right? By 15 to 20%. Okay, my job is to run a company. Um, think, just take DNI out of it for a second. If someone came to me and said, we have a proven thing that will guarantee that you could be 15 to 20% more successful, like, why wouldn't I do that? Right. Okay. D and I is the right thing to do. We got a lot, you know, our industry, especially is, you know, I tell people like, we're really good. If you compare our numbers on a D and I standpoint to the industry, you'd say, wow, BC is at the top of the list. But I'm like, yeah, but we're the top of the worst industry or one of the worst. I mean, that's nowhere to be, you know, how do we lift all boats or how do we raise it up? But again, the things that we're doing, they have to be tied to business sense. Um, there's, you can be, you know, altruistic in some areas, um, you know, but, but again, at the end of the day, we have to be viable. We have to pay salaries. You know, we have to, we have to, you know, pay the cost of keeping the lights on in the buildings. Um, but you can do it. Um, I have great examples of, uh, I'm not at one of the companies I used to be at because they said they were all about it and um, they weren't, you know, they used to be and they changed. And, and, the, and the short version of that story is, is I was running a business uh, where we had a $50 million a year contract for five years. So do the math on that. That's massive. Um, actually, it was 30 million. 30 million for five years at 150 million. It's still a massive project. Uh, I get a phone call one day from the client to come visit them that they had a problem with one of my best managers. Um, and so I go down there and uh, they basically tell me this is in central Louisiana, like middle of that area. And the manager was African-American. And they say, we don't want this guy here anymore. I say, fine, what's he doing? Tell, explain to me what's happening. And they say, the bottom line is that we don't like his kind here. 
Like his kind, what's his kind? You know, it was a black person. They didn't want a black person as the manager. It was okay if they were out, you know, emptying the garbage trucks and stuff like that, but to have a black, you know, this is a real story. So I go back to the president of the group and then strip and I'm like, man, we got a really big problem. And she's like, what do you want to do? And I'm like, well, they, they have a termination for convenience clause. And they said, if we don't take Herb off the job, that we're going to, we're going to lose the contract. Um, and she's like, well, what would you recommend? I'm like, I mean, if it was because he wasn't performing, fine. But this is, this is racist. I mean, this is 100% racism. That's all it is. The guy's killing it. The project's doing great. I said, if it was my decision, I'd fire the client. So she's like, I agree. I'll go to the boss and we'll tell him that. So that was on a Friday. On Monday, we got a note that said, um, uh, you and Elisa have been taken off this job. We're going to give it to somebody else. Huh. Right? They didn't want to lose $150 million, even though everything they did was preach about the importance of equity and, and all this stuff. And you know that played into why I'm not there anymore. So it's a great question. It happens. And there's a lot of companies that get stuck. Um, with that. And uh, we always try to figure it out. I mean, you know, get another example that we did, if you live by your values, uh, we won this really big a $50 million job. These are huge projects. Our average project size is like $800,000. Okay. So when I say 50 million, I don't, I mean, these are big, these don't happen a lot. It was a job uh, in the Pacific Northwest that we really needed. It was a new client we had never worked with before. Um, so it was great. We positioned well, the team there went around because we didn't know this client well. They went to everybody and their brother and sister and said, what's this client gonna ask us in the interview? And they compiled a list of 380 questions that they could possibly ask us on this interview. And the team prepared and they prepared and they go out and they win the job, right? We won it, it was incredible. No one thought we could win it, we won it. They said that we hands down were the best company. We killed it in the interview. And then the, uh, the leader of that interview calls me up and says, hey, I think we got a problem, Rich. I go, what? He says, we had the answers to the test. And I go, what do you mean? He goes, these questions started seeming, they, they started to feel very familiar. And I went back to the different sources of where we got those 300 questions. And the, and the 10 questions they asked us all came from the same sheet of paper. Someone gave us the actual questions. What do we do, right? Okay, this is a great ethics question. So we start talking about it and, you know, you look at everything, you know, so the one option is ignore it, right? That's a real option. Don't worry about it. We won. It's over. Nobody knows. No one's going to find out. Let it go to, you know, we should self-disclose. I mean, we, you know, because what happens if it comes out, right? That's our reputation. That's this. Well, wow. If we self-disclose because it's a municipal uh, procurement process, what normally happens is, is they don't, they want clean process. So if there's any kind of a view of something impropriety happening, they just go to the number two bidder, right? So, so we did the math and we came up and said, there's probably a 60 to 70% chance that if we go to the client, we'll lose the job. And, you know, I knew what I wanted to do, but I asked the team, the people making the decision that ran, I said, what do you want to do? They're like, we got to go to the client. I'm like, yeah, I agree. And if we lose, then, you know, all right, it wasn't meant to be. So we go to the client, we sit down with them, we explain what happens. It was a, uh, a competitor that gave us those questions. It wasn't anyone from the client side. And the, the client had never done a job this big. So they were actually asking the community for questions. And it just happened to be that we were asking at the same time. And they liked that set of questions so much that this competitor gave them that they used them. But in the client said, you know what? We're really excited that you guys came forward uh, to tell us, and that shows us your character. It shows us what kind of company you are. But I don't think, you know, you, you didn't just win on the interview. You won on a lot of stuff and there was nothing wrong in this process that happened. Okay, that's a great outcome, but I can tell you there were sleepless nights, right? I mean, $50 million contract, you make the decision as the CEO to say, yeah, you know, because the likelihood of that ever getting out probably was never gonna happen. But that's what character and that's what values are is what do you do when no one's looking, when no one knows? And I just think that that's the kind of, we have great clients like that. We have other companies that we partner with one day and compete the next that are like that. That's, those are the people you want to work with because that's how you make a difference. It's great stories, Rich. I yeah, really long -winded one, sorry. Yeah, no, we, we love it. Hey, um, anybody want to ask a final question before we, let Rich go to his family or his dinner or 
both or more work or all the above? <laughs> I'm going to eat work-life balance, you know, I can't work every hour of the day. Yeah, me too. Okay. Well, I really appreciate it, Rich. It's been, it's been great. Um, thank you for your time. Thank you for the insight. Thanks for the real world examples. And Angela and Savannah too, thank you very much for, for coming, representing BC. I enjoyed listening. <laughs> thank you. Um, Beth, Beth, do I need to do anything with the recording? Are you gonna be able to access it? You might have to send it to me. Okay. <laughs> Just right. send me the email. It's good. Thank you all. That was Thank lovely. You. All right. Thank you. Good night, everyone. Good night. Thanks, Rich.